Hello everyone, Summer's here and it's time to do our knowledge transfer workshops or KTWs as they're known. Why? Well, what often happens in these situations is a person in an organization goes to an event somewhere else, a workshop in this case, does things, learns things, comes to certain conclusions and insights, develop what have you, and then they go back home and it stays with that person. Perhaps one day that person even leaves their own organization and all of that knowledge and insight leaves with that person. The idea is to disperse or, or transfer, hence the title, transfer this knowledge, insight, understanding to more people in your locality so as to have a greater value and impact, and so on and so forth. Now, what I've done is send you a document and this video is an accompaniment. The document is meant to be a kind of framework that you would use to develop your own knowledge transfer workshop experience. It could be maybe a breakfast meeting or maybe you do something really crazy like a puppet show. I don't really care as long as it works. It is not a set of instructions. Rather, it's a resource for you to use to help you develop and structure, decide what you're going to talk about and try to explain to your people and associates locally. The first section is the OECD lead program checklist. You have to think of this as a kind of very simple, off-the-rack tool to develop your own evaluation system in a, in a very quick kind of way. It's particularly good for getting discussions going as a tool, for getting people to bounce ideas back and forth, and it's quite, it's, it's, it's off-the-rack, quite simple and straightforward. The following section is also from the lead program material, and it's more negative. It's about where these kinds of partnership cooperation experiences commonly go wrong and you're to use this really as a, an exercise to help you be alert for the typical sorts of problems that might arise. Now they've itemized a lot of problem scenarios, what often happens, why they go wrong. I think a lot of these scenarios will probably sound familiar to you. It's just worth it as an exercise to go through, to contemplate, and to keep these things in mind, basically with a view to trying to avoid them happening to you. The next section we go into is about structures, how to structure these systems of cooperation, uh, participatory structures that you're trying to set up locally. Now because we're at the beginning of our project lifecycle, this is a particularly good time to be thinking about how you want to set up these kinds of structures, what kind of structures you want, what you want from them, and so on. We look at how binding or non-binding structures work, the pros and cons of each one. In practice what you'll find most likely is you come to some kind of mix of binding and non-binding or obligatory arrangements. The point is for you to do so consciously and arrive at the balance that works best for your circumstances. The next issue that we talk about is that of agility, agility in management, you could call it operativeness, you could call it various things. The point is that you don't have an unworkable work group. Yeah? For example, this often happens when you have such a large group, it becomes more like a, a parliament than some kind of task force. This means that you have to have some kind of reduced group at the center, the working group, with a larger group of participants and stakeholders around it, articulated in some way. Now, what's the risk with this? The risk is that you end up excluding someone from this core working group who either resents it or whose input is of value and it's a loss that they're not there. This is basically a thing that you have to evaluate and watch out for. The next issue talked about in terms of structural considerations is that of scope. How large or ample uh, uh, participatory focus to have, how many people you want to include, who are all the actors that need to be involved within each sector, how many actors, which actors, how large you need more of a narrow focus. In some cases you might be better off with a more specific focus. Are you, are you throwing your net quite wide? Now, in answering these questions, you'll also probably address the previous question about who not to exclude and be careful of not leaving out. The LEAD program also emphasizes the need for having a stable structure and a designated person who is the, the, the coordinator of the, of the process and that this has to be designated and constant. Now happily we have this pretty much sorted out as an herb backed network because of course you have the structure already set up of a local support group, you've been assigned local coordinator roles in terms of coordinating the local support group, there will either be a local support group coordinator or the local coordinator of the project in general will also take on this role, depending on what made more sense for each of you locally. So this isn't something that you really have to think a lot about immediately. 
But where it is something you want to think about is what will happen after this Urbeck project is over. If we want to have an ongoing structure and practice of local cooperation and participation, what structure will it have? And who is going to coordinate it? The LEAD program also brings out the need to have a participatory structure which can eventually be dismantled when it comes time to move on to some other arrangement. Another thing that gets talked about with the LEAD program is the importance of coordinating figures and how in some cases this might take the place of a participatory structure. This is often useful in circumstances where a participatory structure is not possible for one reason or another, particularly for example when speed is at the essence and they have to act immediately and there's no time to set up a structure and negotiate it, what have you, or there's some other barrier. Now this is not at all what an urbac network is supposed to be about. We're quite specifically having a participatory structure worked out. Now, what they're describing in this section might be somewhat like you find yourself working prior to Jobtown. When Jobtown is over, ideally we're hoping to leave behind some kind of legacy structure or practice of participation and cooperation, correct? You might find that when the urbac project wraps up, your local support group sadly goes dormant for one reason or another, in which case you might have to fall back on a kind of plan B, where you have a, an enhanced local coordinating role, hopefully feeding off uh, what the experience of Jobtown left you with. Any number of different structures are possible. I won't make any effort to enumerate all of them. It's, there's so many flowcharts and organograms you could generate along these lines. It's just it's not something that interests me very much. What we've talked about so far have basically fallen under two categories of these very general structural typologies. We've talked about a kind of approach of uh, concentric circles where you might have a more core working group with uh, a network of consulted, participating stakeholders around it, articulated in some way or another, and then even wider rings around that where you might talk about public consultations, theoretically consulting every citizen in the locality. Another thing we've looked at is breaking the work down into task forces or different work groups by theme so as to, to have people work on things that are relevant to them. For instance, you might have one group working on guidance services, one group working on support for self-employment, one group working on educational reform. And then, of course, what you would have to have is some kind of structure that coordinates these, that brings cohesion, that connects them so there's a, a sense of cohesion and coordination. There could be any number of these different structures. There's no specific model which is the right model for everyone. This is something you have to work out for what makes most sense for you. Fair enough. So we're not telling you what structure to adopt. Rather, we're interested in seeing what works out best for each locality on the ground. What we are saying, and this is very important, is that any model you adopt, which begins as a somewhat abstract proposition, a model with a flowchart or something, is that it be flexible and pragmatic. You might have certain actors which are very important for involving, for example, large-scale local employers, various opinion leaders, or young people themselves. To engage young people, you might have to adapt the approaches that you're using. Yeah? And of course, these are important actors that need to be involved. So you might have a somewhat abstract model or for structuring the participation, but then you might be needing to have some kind of ad hoc adaptation where necessary, where it makes sense. Now, how about evaluation? We began talking about a checklist, but that's quite a small thing. Evaluation is a large part of the process, and it should be part of the process from the very beginning. What I've done is set out a series of lead principles for evaluation of this kind of partnership that we're, we're trying to do here, and then accompany it with comments relating it to the context of an urbac network, and more specifically, the situation of Jobtown itself, our needs and the structures and what have you. Now, of course, this is something of an off-the-rack system. It sets you out a structure for evaluation, a way of approaching evaluation that you can pick up and run with right away. You're free to adapt it. You probably should eventually. But it's a good starting point to have something already there that you can work with and think about how you're going to carry out or how you're going to, rather, embed an evaluation process into the whole functioning of, of our network from beginning to end and hopefully beyond. Now, we include some practical examples. Basically, this is for you to look at them and see what you can get from them for your own needs in your specific locality, right? 
Not surprisingly, the first one we talk about is the Pact, Aviles Avanza. What we want you to do here is really look at it and see what you can get from it that speaks to your own local needs, what you brought back from what you saw there, and the do's and don'ts you would bring forward. What I've given you are some of the main discussion points that you'll see coming up into this. This is really what you want to focus on because the main thing for you is to develop a good discussion about what you're going to do in your locality and leverage this particular example so as to get that ball rolling locally. What are we going to do? What do we need? I've given you below a brief description of the Aviles uh, system, the PAC system there, its background, its purpose, and what have you. This is just to give you a, a quick resource if you want to explain to someone what, what this practice is, what it consists of. Next, we look at Thurok's Memorandum of Understanding that they use with their different participants. This is a very good practice and one that I would encourage you to look at and see what you can take from it for your own use. Likewise, I've included Avedo's roadmap document, which is rather well done, I think, and it's probably a good idea for you to have a look at it to see how you might do your own. Look at Enfield's approach to working with neighboring administrations within what they define as functional economic areas. This is a system based on defining a territory in terms of flows of activity, transport, goods, people, etc., rather than administrative boundaries. Now, some of you might look at this and find it a practice that's appropriate for you to adopt or adapt in some way to your own circumstances. Others of you might already be doing something along these lines and might be able to use Jobtown as an opportunity to enhance this already existing local cooperation with neighboring areas. Either way, it's something that's worth thinking of. Achieving a better practice for working with neighboring administrations and territories would certainly be no small achievement, and it's something worth pursuing. A fundamental issue is, of course, involving the target group itself in a project, working with issues, services, things that affect them and concern them personally. This is not something that's easy to do in a way that's meaningful, particularly with youth. Often, as we've discussed, there are issues of tokenism that get involved, and we want to find a way to do this in a way that has real value. Now, what I've done to get into this discussion is to set out the example that we saw in Aviles with these young people who reviewed the local services, how they were implemented, and produced a report upon them, and did these various non-formal learning activities that described and criticized them and what have you. I'm not particularly concerned about you knowing everything there is to know about this practice in Aviles. Rather, I'm interested in seeing how you can take that example and leverage it to get a discussion going about how you can achieve valuable and meaningful involvement of the target group of young people in your own locality. As before, I begin with a discussion of some of the main talking points around this issue and then below provide a brief background on the, the example in Aviles and how it works and so on if you have to describe it to someone. Then we go into what's titled a mapping of the main learning. This is simply uh, photographs of the, the mind through word map exercise that we did where we talked about what had come out of the experience of the workshop. I put these in because I thought it might be a useful way for you to jog your own memory and, and, and go back and recollect what we were talking about, some of the main issues. I think it's just good to have a look at them and see if it gets the thoughts going. If you want to show them to someone else, I think that would be useful by all means. It's your call. I want you to talk with your people locally about synergies with the other Jobtown partners. Basically this is about what, what you can get from them, where there are parallels with your situation, where there might be interesting opportunities for exchange and, and so on. Now since a lot of them haven't actually met these people, you're the conduit for giving them a picture of what, what kind of network it is and, and what's out there. And This is something really uh, worthwhile doing. I put a list of all the uh, partner members what I would suggest you do is go through and make some quick notes about each one, what you recall, and bring it out, and identify what's salient, what's, what's worth knowing for the local people about the points of interest of the different partners. I don't want you to go through some sort of exhaustive list. We have the baseline study for anyone who wants to read it. What I really want you to do is to bring forward where you see opportunities for working with, learning from, and cooperating with the other partners. Well, so what next? Well, what's next is you have to do your KTW, your Knowledge Transfer Workshop, and I hope you do it as soon as possible. As you know, we're in the holiday period and organizing these kinds of things gets more and more difficult as time goes on, but really I think you want to get this out of the way at the latest early September. You need to do a roadmap. This needs to be something that gives people uh, a quick sense of the whole project, 
where we're going, what's going to happen. Don't worry about being locked into some kind of commitment. You can always adapt it as you go along. The point is to have it there and something you can, you can grab a hold of and, and see what's going to happen. Once you guys get your knowledge transfer workshops done, what we have to do is each of us, me and, and each one of you, we have to get together, uh, preferably on Skype, and have a wrap-up session on how it went. I really want to hear about how you went about doing it and how that worked out for you, what observations you might have from the, the way you tried to do it and, and how people reacted and so forth. Why? Because this is one of the themes that we're trying to learn about in the process of this particular project. Why? Because this is a, a constant issue with these European transnational projects, how to do them in such a way that the knowledge generated gets embedded in the different organizations involved rather than staying with one person who might eventually disappear or move on and so on. Yeah. So that's the thing we're going to talk about and try and develop a, a, a growing sense of this issue as the project matures. I thought I'd leave you with a few comments from Andy Smith. He's an elected councillor from Thurrock in the UK, one of our participating localities in Jobtown. What he has to say is happily both sensible and succinct. I hope you enjoy it and I hope you enjoy the rest of your summer. Goodbye everyone. I'd just like to say that one of the very key things about a partnership is keeping it simple. You don't want it too complicated. Everyone must understand it. Another important thing is, trouble is when councils, you know, local councils start to run things, sometimes they take over and people don't want to be lectured to all the time. People want to have their own say and they want to think they're contributing. They don't want to think they've just been invited because they, they make up the numbers or they're from a certain area or, or, or they're the token children who have been invited that week or something. So you need, you need to be enthusiastic and you need to make sure you don't do all the talking because sometimes you can have somebody from children's services, somebody from the economic partnership, someone from regeneration and they all work for the same council. So you, all around the table it's careful you don't dominate because once you dominate people tend to uh, switch off. They need to have their say and they need to involve themselves. And of course, I think it's already been made clear, you do need simple goals and simple, simple requirements because otherwise people switch off and it's too complicated. So keep it simple, smile a lot, encourage people. Because <laughs> people don't want to sit down and be bored and lectured to. So, you know, try and throw a the odd joke or something like that. And so encourage people, you know, relax people, make sure they've got a cup of tea or something. Because it's very important to relax people and get people... Because if it's too formal, people don't like to know. If we're all tight, and back, relax, but go for it. And then when you've had an achievement, celebrate the achievement and make a big fuss about it. Invite people to a party to celebrate it or something. Because that's good. Cause, and thank people all the time. Thank you for coming. Thank you for working with us. This is what we've done this year. Because otherwise people get turned off. So encourage people. Encouragement is very important. In a partnership. Thank you.